I think we need another one. Another one? No, I thought we could have it. Let's we'll try it. Thank you. That was recorded this time. Right? <laughs> All right, so we didn't go far last time, but who can tell me again in simple word, one word or two words, what is chromatography? David? Separate things. Separate things. A lot of things. Yes, it's an analytical method of separation of components within a mixture. Great. All right, let's. Let's see if you know any of this. It's okay if you don't know, but one thing about chromatography, you need to have interaction first. If you do not have an interaction with the stationary phase, there will be no separation, okay? Like the example of the justice and the girl that want to interact with little things in the store, you have to have interactions in order to achieve separation. So, what kind of interactions happen when you have a chromatography. chromatography. Brigida? Brigida goes with the simplest answer, <laughs> which is all of the above, and it is correct. Okay? We will learn about this in detail. It's just all of the above in adsorption chromatography, the interaction between a molecule and the stationary phase could be electrostatic by charge, could be via hydrogen bonding or could be via hydrophobic interactions. There will be other interactions like van der Waals this could be another one. But we'll talk about that when we get to adsorption chromatography. In reverse phase chromatography, have you heard of the term reverse phase before? Any of you? If you have not heard of that term, you won't know the answer. Yeah, that's okay. So in reverse phase chromatography, we learn that this is a type of chromatography where we will have a stationary phase that is non-polar. That means does not like water, a stationary phase. And the other phase that is a moving phase, a mobile phase, would be mostly polar. <coughs> this is called reverse phase, and I'll explain later why it's called reverse phase. But for now, if you start with a stationary phase that is not polar, and a mobile phase, the phase that is moving and carrying with it the compounds, is mostly polar, what happens? Polar compounds elute. Elute means leave the column or leave the stationary phase first. Non-polar compounds elute or leave first, <clears throat> or the mobile phase is polar, I already answered that. So which of these do you think is correct? Think about it logically. So you have a non-polar stationary phase and a polar mobile phase. And your compounds are moving, interacting with the column and moving with the mobile phase. But they don't A and C, correct. So polar compounds will interact the least with your not polar uh, stationary phase. So let's say Pam is polar, her daughter is not polar, <coughs> Justice is reverse phase, stationary phase. So I'm not going to interact with any of the components I'm going to leave first. So the compound that's going to interact the most will be delayed will be leaving last. And this is how we separate. We separate based on how the affinity of these molecules to your stationary phase and the affinity of these molecules to the mobile phase that is moving along. Okay? A little bit of a historical perspective on chromatography. Long, long time ago, towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, we had scientists that discovered chromatography. The first one, actually, that used this kind of principle was an American biologist, David Day, and he separated, using, using fuller earth, crude petroleum. <clears throat> but he did not really give the, the principle any name or did not you know, define it or put anything 
um, kind of a principle to it. Mikhail's bet, the Russian botanist, was the first to actually name that analytical tool or principle. And the name come, came from chromophores, those that absorb light, compounds that absorb light. Why did he name it that way? Because what he used it for, he used chalk as a stationary page. He got the column and packed it with chalk and separated the leaf pigments. So the pigments of the leaves were separated using that column that he prepared. And because he was looking at colorful pigments, compounds, that are chromophores, that means they absorb light or reflect light, that they could be called the principal chromatography. Okay? But not everything we separate by chromatography obviously absorb light. We can separate so many different compounds that are not naturally chromophores. But anyway, that's where the name came from. <coughs> he was credited for its discovery. And then from there on, it went in oblivion for a while, and then it was recovered where partition chromatography was formed as well as paper chromatography, and we'll talk about them in detail later. But the, but the chromatography that advanced the most first was gas chromatography. It got advanced and used mostly for petroleum industry. And the technology gained from gas chromatography helped develop liquid chromatography, which is becoming more and more popular and uh, used for so many different applications. Another form of chromatography is supercritical fluid chromatography, which we'll talk about as well briefly later on. Okay. Uses. Can you think of uses of chromatography? Now, we said separation of things, but I want ex examples, specific examples, in where, where we use chromatography. Is that oh, for like sugar characterization? Sugar mm -hmm. characterization. So, like looking at the different components of sugars, analyzing them. Like, for example, if we want to look at dietary fiber. And the components of dietary fiber, what are the small sugars that make up dietary fiber? Or the components of dietary fiber, do we have cellulose, do we have hemicellulose, lignin, a pectin? What do we have? We can use uh, chromatography to look at the components of carbohydrates and sugars. Okay, what else? That's good. Trophy? Flavor matches? Flavor, yes, we use gas chromatography mostly for flavor compounds, the aromatic uh, flavor or, or odor compounds. And definitely we use gas chromatography for identification and quantification of flavor components. Perfect, what else? Oh, maybe. It's used for so many different things. You're going to have a lab on. Have you looked ahead on what's, what's the lab? Um, it's used to separate pigments. Separating colors and pigments, yes. But have you looked ahead to what we're doing in the lab in a couple of weeks? We're going to determine, for example, caffeine in different beverages <laughs> using liquid chromatography. What else? Another lab is we're going to look at fatty acid composition of different oils and uh, you're going to get different oils and then they will be all unknown you won't know which is which and you'll get in, you will get the amino acid composition you will run that by GC and you will identify your unknown oils based on the fatty acid composition it's a very powerful tool especially for example if looking at adulteration olive oil is often adulterated just because of price and yeah lower cost oil and then you sell them for olive oil which is more expensive then you can detect adulteration of olive oil by looking at fatty acid composition um well, how about pesticides pa yes pesticides definitely there are the volatile pesticides the non polar Pesticides using GC and then the polar pesticides by HPLC. Mycotoxins, 
allergens. It's a whole, you will see as liquid chromatography and GC chromatography coupled with mass spectrometry throughout the semester. It's a very powerful tool. Characterizing amino acid composition, um, looking at aromatic compounds, phenols, for example, phenolic compounds in um, plant sources, phytochemicals, that is. So there are so many different applications that is used in food analysis for chromatography. Chromatography is also a tool to isolate uh, components. For example, um, <laughs> the Visco, which is now Agropore, uh, use a very unique technique to produce whey protein isolate. They don't use membrane filtration, they use ion exchange chromatography. They use chromatography to purify uh, whey protein isolate and produce over 90% protein purity with very high functionality. So it's used as a tool to separate, purify, and produce components that can be used as ingredients. Uh, it can be used for molecular weight determination. Let's say we are hydrolyzing our uh, a protein ingredient or even hydrolyzing starch for certain enhancement in functionality. And then you can look at change in the profile of the hydrolysate. So the length of the peptides or the length of maltodextrins you generate. So characterizing your products uh, using size exclusion um, chromatography. Um, yeah, so many examples. We will be given a lot of those throughout the semester. Okay. So extraction is kind of the principle that we want to learn because based on extraction, uh, partition chromatography was developed. And partition chromatography is based on partitioning the molecules between two liquid phases. So your stationary phase is liquid, your mobile phase is liquid, and then we're looking at the affinity of the different compounds in a mixture to those two different liquid phases. So that's why we call it partition, because they're partitioning between two liquid phases. And the extraction is kind of what brought about partition chromatography the principle of extraction. The principle of extraction is transferring a solute or a component from one liquid phase to another phase. So it is commonly used for many different purposes. One is actual means of analysis. You will see that when we uh, extract fat to determine fat content. So we actually use solvents to extract fat. So we have our food product and then we add a solvent that would solubilize the nonpolar fats. So it could be ether, diethyl ether or petroleum ether, it can be hexane, it could be chloroform. All of these organic solvents can be used to remove the fat and potentially measure the amount of fat in your, uh, in your sample. So actual means of analysis, so extracting fat to determine fat. Preliminary sample step, oftentimes fat interfere in certain analytical experiments. So if I'm looking at uh, total sugars, soluble sugars, in, um, in a flour sample, I really have to remove the fat first as a first step. So remove a cleanup of the sample, removing fat to characterize other components so it's no longer interfering. So we extract the fat using extraction procedure. It could be batch or continuous. I'll talk about that in a minute. So sample cleanup uh, is one way of utilizing extraction. Another, another uh, need for extraction in which is when we are concentrating a component of interest, say flavor. Flavor components are present in a very, very small concentration. In order to analyze them, you have to extract them from the complex matrix, concentrate them, and then run them through the GC to analyze them. So extraction happens to concentrate certain components and, and run analysis on it. So it's a very strong and powerful tool, and we almost use it almost in every procedure. So the different extractions that are used, we have batch extraction, 
With batch extraction, uh, we often do that in the lab. For example, we want we have um, a product after extracting the oil, we want to extract the protein from that matrix. So we use batch extraction with hexane. So you basically put uh, your sample in hexane and stir, and then remove the um, solvent layer, and then um, separate the two phases from each other. But if you have two liquid phases, so you have two immiscible um, solutions. So you have the aqueous phase and then you have an organic phase. So there are two liquid phases, and you are you are really interested in the let's say the organic phase. And for example, we'll learn about that in extraneous matter. So the chapter that talks about the filth measurement of filth in foods for the quality. Um, we use organic solvents to do that, to, to extract the filth component. So batch extraction can be done, and you're probably familiar with separatory funnel. Probably you've seen it in chemistry and used it in chemistry, yeah? So you separate the two, you shake and then let them settle, you separate the two phases. Not the most efficient way of extraction. Another efficient way of extraction is continuous or semi-continuous extraction. And this is an example of a sock slit apparatus, which we will learn about in um, doing the fat extraction uh, lab. So here you will put your uh, solvent that would have low boiling point, would be a trollium ether or ether ether. And then you will have your sample that you want to extract, let's say, the oil or the fat out in, in, a, in a compartment here, sample compartment in a thimble. Um, it's a con small container. And then what happens, you heat this and then your solvent evaporates, goes up to a condenser. You have running cold water here, condenses the solvent into your sample, solubilize the fat in this case, and then after reaching a certain point, the solvent with the oil siphons back into the original container. And the cycle continues because this is, there is a hot plate down here that continuously your solvent is evaporating, going up, and then condensing on your sample, dissolving the oil, then going back, and the cycle continues. That's another form of extraction. Countercurrent extraction is the extraction type that led to chromatography or partition chromatography. So I want to show this. Um, let me see if I can do this from here. This guy here is the guy that invented it. So Okay, so countercurrent extraction is basically a series of tubes, like this one tube here. You have a series of tubes linked together. Let me just uh, go back here. So this is how it really looks like. So you have a series of tubes linked together, and they can, they can actually they can shake them. And then each the compartment contain whatever is contained in each tube get transferred to the next tube, and I'll show you how that works. Okay. <laughs> Where did it go? So what happens here, you start off with, uh, you start off with a mixture of two compounds. And then you have your stationary phase, the white liquid is your stationary phase, that means it is present in each tube and it doesn't move from one tube to the other. The blue phase here is your mobile phase. That's the phase that's going to be transferred, and this is the phase where you injected or you had your mixture in. So 
that's extract. So when you extract, you're shaking the whole of the tubes and then you're transferring your mobile phase to the next tube. Okay. So what happens here, your compounds are moving from here to here to here, etc. So from the first extraction, we saw that the red compound moved faster. What does that tell you? The difference between the green and the red. The Michelle? Red would be lighter. What the does? The, um, the compound that's first started by red would be lighter because the control more easily. Well, not necessarily lighter. So it moved more with the mobile phase. What does it tell you about its affinity to the stationary phase versus the mobile phase? It definitely moved faster, but why do you think? Regina? Because it had more affinity towards the mobile phase. That is that is correct. So the green compound here likes the stationary phase better. And remember what I told you in chromatography. In order to separate, you have to have an interaction. And you have to have difference in interactions, difference in affinity. If you don't have differences in affinity between the, start, the stationary phase and the mobile phase, you won't separate them. You have to look for something else that provides differences in affinity. So that's, that's the thing. So the, the red is liking more than the phase that is moving, whereas the green is liking more the stationary phase. So if I continue to do extract and transfer, what are we seeing? What are you observing here? What's a, a very clear phenomenon? When you're extracting and transferring, what's happening? Concentration. Huh? Concentration. Concentrations? What's happening with the concentrations? What's happening to these compounds? Separation. They're, they're separating. Look at them. They're becoming two distinct peaks. Soon we will learn about chromatography peaks. So when you run a chromatography, the output that you would see from your detector is in a form of a chromatography peak. So this would be whatever you're measuring, absorption or FID or whatever is the flame ionization detector. So you're looking at the ionization, the, con the change in ionization. So, or a change in absorption, or whatever is your detector, and here it's time. So, you actually get a chromatogram that will show you that at certain time point, we are separating the two components. So, this in, in counter current extraction, you can also see that, that the, the more tubes we have in line, the more tubes we have, the better you're going to get the separation of these two compounds. So this translates to the length of a column later on we learn is the longer the column, the better the separation you're going to get. So here we go. I continue my extract and transfer. And then at one point, the red compound is going to elute or leave before the green one. Actually, you can start seeing that the compound B, you start seeing that it's coming out. 8.57% is coming out. And then if I continue, eventually I will collect all of my compound B, and then I can bring another collection tube or flask and collect my compound A. So in this way, I separated the two compounds from each other. You can see that I'm almost done with collecting B, and then soon I start seeing the A coming out here. I almost a perfect separation. If I want an even better separation, I can add even more tubes, and I get better separation as well. But this is a pretty decent separation. So you got the idea, right? Do I need to continue with this thing? 
eventually B will be eluted and then A will start to be collected. Okay, good. So, what we're seeing here, the base of separation is based on at equilibrium, where there is equilibrium that means the, the amount of solute in one phase and the amount of solute in the other phase is constant. So the partition coefficient is what we call that, the concentration of solute in phase one over the concentration of solute in phase two. So at equilibrium, this is constant, and we call it partition coefficient. So the solute has partitioned between two phases. And later on, keep that in mind, don't worry about it now, but keep that in mind, you learn about series of equilibrium in a column. So when, when a compound is, in, is moving through a column, it goes through a series of equilibrium, because it goes from the top of the column to the end of the column, so it's continuously moving. And, and every spot, it reaches equilibrium, and then it moves again, and then reaches equilibrium. So there will be series of equilibrium until we separate the compounds and we can identify them, we can them, <coughs> etc. So if we have a solution that is more soluble in phase one, that means phase one is, let's say phase one is the moving phase and phase two is the stationary phase, then we can separate them. If they have similar affinity to both, we won't be able to separate them. So if solution A is, or in our case, solute B was more soluble in the phase two, that means the moving phase, and phase one is your stationary phase, so solute B will be moving along more than solute A, and that's what we have seen. Okay. So, there are several terms or terminology in chromatography that will keep popping up, and I've already started talking about solute, stationary phase, mobile phase, so I want you to know these terms. So when I say solute, what do I mean? It's the component soluble in a certain solution or your, your component of interest that you're trying to analyze. So that's your solute, the, the component soluble in your particular extract that you're analyzing. Stationary phase, from the name, the phase that does not move, okay? It could be a liquid phase, same as in the counter uh, extraction that we just seen, the example, counter current extraction. Or it could be a solid phase. So your stationary phase can be liquid or solid. Your mobile phase, we can, can also be called the eluting solvent. That means the solvent that is carrying the compounds along to elute, to let them leave the column or leave the paper or leave the thin layer plate. So the eluting solvent is also known as mobile phase. You will hear that term. Carrier gas, this is in gas chromatography. You don't have a liquid carrying your compounds. Hence, gas chromatography. You have a gas moving along, and the compounds of interest evaporates into the gas phase and move along with the gas. So you learn that in gas chromatography. And then you have the supercritical fluid, which we'll learn about also shortly, where, where that's for example, CO2 under high pressure and change in temperature can be liquid. So that is called a supercritical fluid. Again, it would be uh, the, the phase that is moving. We talked a little bit about series of equilibrium and we will come back to that. You will, because mostly you have a column and you have a compound moving through the column with a mobile phase. So at every position in the column, you have an equilibrium where you have a constant concentration 
uh, or distribution between your uh, session interface and the mobile phase. So there will be a series of iterations. Okay. We are just introducing terms and we'll come back to them. Don't feel overwhelmed at the moment. We're just introducing the terms. If you want, if you want is the solute that is leaving the column, your compound of interest that is leaving the column is also called the eluent. Eluent is the verb we use to, to say that, okay, we are eluting your compound. So it's a verb used for, um, not, I can't, is there another name, word for eluting? So basically, it's the removal from the column. Um, and then the chromatographic key that I just explained, we'll come back to it more closely. We'll spend time on uh, identifying it, into interpreting it. Yes, Ma. Is that a question just for the chromatography? Is it like the, the way that we do it before we enter anything for GC mass or HPLC and all that stuff? Or like each one has something different? So, I'm not sure I got your question, but if we want to analyze a component, it has to start separated from a mixture. We have to start with chromatography, and then we can analyze it with a detector. It could be an MS detector. But the, most, mostly you would want to, it will be a mixture of things, you want to separate them so that you can individually detect them and quantify them. So it's kind of the initial step before identification and detection and quantification. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a mixture of a lot of different things. You won't be able to differentiate. Is that was that your yes. question? So again, these were all terms that I want you to be familiar with as we start talking about them in the future couple of lectures. All right. So chromatography is a separation technique. Okay, that is, this is how we define it. The separation technique used in food analysis, and it is based on the partition and distribution of a solute between a stationary phase and a mobile phase, phase one, phase two. You get a partition coefficient or distribution coefficient. Partition coefficient is um, for, used for liquid, liquid um, mobile and stationary phase. When your both phases are liquid, you use the term partition. It's partitioning between two liquid phases. When you have a liquid and solid, or gas and a liquid, or gas and a solid, you say you call it distribution. The distribution of the solute between the two phases, two different phases. Okay, so partition is when both are liquid. Distribution is when at least one of them is uh, liquid and the other is solid, or gas and liquid, or gas and solid, for in the case of gas chromatography. All right, so now, now that you, we are talking about terms and general stuff, we'll go and talk about each component in more detail. <coughs> Okay, so under chromatography, you have different types of chromatography, okay? The different types of chromatography or categories of chromatography, we have the gas chromatography, which you'll have two uh, lectures on. Superphysical fluid chromatography, we'll touch upon it very briefly. We're not going to have an application on it. And then liquid chromatography, most of the... Uh, introduction to chromatography will be based on liquid chromatography, and then we'll have a specific lecture on HPLC, high performance chromatography. So these are the main types of chromatography. And underneath liquid chromatography, you have subtypes or subcategories. The paper and thin layer chromatography, we call them planar chromatography. Um, they're not a column, a plane, a paper, or a thin layer 
chromatography and both of them known as PAN. And then you have the more common, more applicable type of chromatography, which is the column chromatography. Column chromatography can be gas chromatography or liquid chromatography can also be uh, called column chromatography. Because they will, you will use a column that is packed with your stationary. Then it comes to your combination of stationary phase and mobile phase. Okay. So in paper chromatography and thin layer chromatography, your mobile phase and stationary phase are both liquid. You're going to say, but paper is not liquid. No, it's not liquid, that's right. But you absorb a liquid phase on your paper. So oftentimes it's your paper, your cellulose paper, and then you have water absorbed on that paper and that becomes your uh, stationary phase which is liquid. Thin layer chromatography, similar case, you have a liquid absorbed to an inert surface and then you have a mobile phase. In column chromatography, again the same thing, you can have um, an inert Material, that means inert means it does not interact with anything. A solid inert material that you absorb on it your liquid phase and then pack your pulp, pack it in a pulp. And then your mobile phase will be liquid. So this is called partition chromatography. This is also partition chromatography. Or your column is packed with an interactive or reactive um, stationary phase and it could be a solid so not an inert solid a solid that will interact with your components and then your mobile phase would be liquid so the first word here is your mobile phase and the second after the backslash is your stationary phase okay. in gas chromatography your mobile phase from the name is gas, always. Your stationary phase in the olden times used to be just a solid matrix, but mostly now the columns are made of inert solid material and a thin layer of a liquid material. And that is your liquid stationary phase. So the name was, or it could be referred to as gas liquid chromatography, but for short, they call it gas chromatography. And then Gary's going to spend more time on that. So, if I want to focus on color liquid chromatography, which is the main application in uh, liquid chromatography. I'll briefly talk about paper and thin layer chromatography, but a lot of our discussion uh, will be on color liquid chromatography. So I said when it's liquid, liquid, we call it partition. With, when it's liquid solid, we call it absorption chromatography. So under both partition and absorption, we can have reverse phase and normal phase. Okay, now I'm going to explain what normal phase is versus reverse phase. From the original modes of separation, this now I'm going to go, this is called mode of separation. So mode of separation is reverse phase or normal phase or hydrophobic interaction. We go into the rest. So when I ask you what types of chromatography I mean, is it liquid chromatography, is it gas chromatography? If I say what mode of separation, you're going to tell me reverse phase or normal phase, it's the others will come. <coughs> Okay, so just to learn the terminology here. Okay, so now what is normal phase? It was one of the original uh, partition chromatography started by having a polar stationary phase and a nonpolar mobile phase. And from there the name became normal phase because that is how they started. They started with a polar phase as your stationary phase and a non-polar phase as your mobile phase. Later on, they said, oh, wait a second, we can reverse that. 
and separate different types of molecules based on their non-liking of water instead of based on their liking of water. So they reversed that. Then they said, ah, oh, okay, we can have the stationary phase as nonpolar and the mobile phase as polar, and hence the name reverse phase. It's just order of events and what they started with first. So it doesn't mean anything, normal or not normal, normal or reverse, doesn't mean anything but what came originally, what they started with originally, the scientists. But what you need to remember is normal phase means polar stationary and nonpolar mobile phase, and reverse phase is the opposite, nonpolar stationary and polar mobile. Another mode of separation is hydrophobic interaction chromatography. Hydrophobic interaction chromatography is based on separation of molecules based on their hydrophobicity, disliking of water. So we talk about it in more detail, and there are specific applications for this type of chromatography. And affinity chromatography is a very um, unique adsorb type of adsorption chromatography based on strong affinity of a compound to a particular stationary phase. Very strong and unique affinity. Ion exchange is another mode of separation that is based on separation by charge. So you would have charged molecules and you're separating them based on their charge density, charge type, charge density. Are they positively charged? Are they negatively charged? And the charge density is like, what, how many charges do they carry? So a hydrophobic interaction chromatography, ion exchange chromatography, affinity chromatography, normal and reverse phase can be adsorption chromatography. Okay? They can be adsorption in when your stationary phase is solid. Okay? Partition chromatography is only when you have liquid, liquid, and separation based on polarity. That means dissolving of the solutes in different phases based on their polarity. Now, self exclusion is its own category. Why is that? Why is this? away from all of this. Any idea? What is size exclusion? We are separating based on their size. It has a different name too. It can be no, named gel permeation. It means the same thing. Permeation through a gel matrix based on the pore sizes. Okay, so it's put aside here because there is no interaction with the stationary phase. No whatsoever interaction with the stationary phase. The stationary phase is only a polymer with uh, different pore sizes. So the, the molecules are only separating based on their size. They're not interacting with anything. They're not liking the mobile phase more than the stationary phase. There is no liking there. There is no affinity there. So the only thing that they are separating based on is how small they are, how big they are. Can they enter the pores or they cannot enter the pores? So that's why it's in a separate category by itself. This is a very important table to learn from and to study from. It summarizes everything we talked about so far, except uh, uh, superphysical, we have not reached that yet. But we talked about reverse phase, normal phase, ion exchange, size <coughs> exclusion, hydrophobic, and affinity. And in there, what type of mobile phase and stationary phase we have? For example, in gas liquid chromatography, you have gas as mobile and liquid as uh, your, you know, sorry, yes, liquid as your stationary phase. Gas solid, you have solid as stationary and gas as your mobile phase. Reverse phase, you have polar liquid as your uh, mobile phase and nonpolar liquid 
or solid for your stationary phase. And then, and the rest is, um, it would tell you for the rest as well. And how do they get separated? Based on what? When I say retention, do you know what we mean by retention? That's also a term that will come up throughout. Retention time, retention volume. By retention, thing. Yes, simple. How long it stays in the system? How long it stays on your stationary phase or interacting with your stationary phase? Either interacting or moving within the stationary phase in case of a site exclusion. Okay, how long it takes. So the retention, how long it stays, how long it takes, it depends in gas chromatography on molecular size and polarity. And also another component is boiling point. Because in gas chromatography, the, the solute need to be um, evaporated. And they need to evaporate into the gaseous state in, in order to move in your mobile. Um, in reverse phase, polarity, normal phase, polarity, ion exchange, molecular charge, size exclusion, molecular size. Molecular size plays a role in a lot of different things because molecular size impact polarity as well. The smaller the molecule, the more polar it is. The larger, larger the molecule, the less polar it is. So that's why it impacts polarity and it impacts also boiling point. Uh, you learn that in the GT lab. Yeah. So this is a good summary table that you need to study and learn. It helps you understand and select when there is a case in a quiz or a test. When I tell you what mode of separation, you would be able to uh, explain that once you know uh, these different characteristics. Very quickly, um, gas chromatography, you will have two lectures on them, but I'll just introduce gas chromatography here. In gas chromatography, you, you will have a column, but it's a very unique column, different than high-performance liquid chromatography column. It's a very long column, can be meters in length, and it's a very thin column. And within that column, you have a, a packed material that is your stationary phase. What happens here, you need a, a mobile phase. Your mobile phase, in, in some cases, is helium. And helium is an inert gas. So it is, we call it a carrier gas. So it carries through into the system and carries the sample once it gets injected into the system. So you have your helium as a carrier gas, you have the injection port where you inject the sample, the sample gets carried with the helium, gets into the column, interacts with the material in the column, and the column is placed in an oven. So the oven is heated and you can generate a gradient, like over time the temperature can go up. And then your components in the sample evaporate at certain times and then leave with the helium and then they go onto the detector. In this case, it's an example of flame ionization detector where you need an oxygen source and a hydrogen source to generate the flame. You'll learn more about that with Gary. But once it gets to a detector, you can detect the compound as they leave the column. So it is used for separation of thermally stable volatiles. If you have components that will degrade by heat, or in other words, thermally labile, GC is not used unless you derivatize them. And we will uh, do that in the lab, derivatizing thiol acid, and we'll learn more about that in the GC. You have a controlled temperature gradient where, like I said, in the oven, the column is heated at different time points. The temperature increases to allow for evaporation of the compounds into the carrier uh, gas. So your volatiles are separated based on, your, on their molecular size, polarity, and boiling point. And molecular size is uh, indicates polarity or has an impact on polarity and boiling point. I know everybody's closing their lab notebooks. Okay, no, no, lab lecture notebooks. Okay, we can stop here. Have a great weekend.